All right. I'd like to start off today by telling you guys a story. In 1966, a man named George Klusterhaus was working as an insurance clerk. Now, in the course of his work, he often found it necessary to make corrections to photocopies. As was the process of the day, he would cover up the mistake with a correction fluid and write his fix over top of it. However, in practice, he found that this often left the photocopy smudged. He knew that there had to be a better way to do this. So he enlisted the help of his friend, Edwin Gilpan, who at the time was working as a basement waterproofer. Together, they experimented with various chemicals and formulations until they hit upon one that covered the text completely. Together, the product that these two men developed later went on to be known as every student's favorite tool, whiteout. Now, both of these men were outsiders to the world of office supplies. So what allowed them, of all people, to come up with such a revolutionary and creative idea that not even the office supply manufacturers of the day could come up with? The short answer? is that they were simply more creative. The long answer, well, it's a little more interesting than that. First, we have to ask ourselves, what is creativity? And it might seem like a simple question on its face, but have you ever actually asked yourselves that? I'd like to address this question by addressing some of the myths that surround creativity. The first myth is that creativity is an external force. This was a belief widely held by the ancient Greeks, who saw creativity as being given to them by the nine goddesses known as the Muses. And while we no longer believe in divine intervention and creativity, if you simply look at the words we use when discussing creativity, you can see that creativity as an external concept is still alive and well. The last time you had an idea, think about it. Have you ever said, it just came to me? Or it hit me like a bolt out of the blue? In both these cases, your creativity is something external to yourself acting upon you. In fact, if you look at all of the visual metaphors we use for creativity, it's some sudden, often violent violation of our person by some outside force. If you were just to look at the words that we use about creativity, you would think it'd be something painful or undesirable. But in practice, we all know that this isn't the case. So, why do we use these words? I think we use these words simply because we don't fully understand what creativity is. So it's easier to assume that it's just the work of some lucky, random strikes than it is to fully figure it out. But if creativity were the work of lucky random strikes, then why does it seem to strike some people more than others? This is what leads most people to the second myth of creativity, which is that creativity is an innate gift, something you're just born with, like height, a gift I was sadly born without. <laughs> However, in order to address this myth, I'd like to address it by going back to the creators of White House. You'd think that two men who had such a revolutionary creative idea would be lifelong creatives, with more patents to their name than you can count. But you'd be wrong. In fact, if you look up patents under the name Edwin Johannet, the man who actually developed the formula for whiteout, you'll find only one. And it's not even for whiteout. It's for this strange device. Uh, it's supposed to keep your blanket off of your feet at night while still keeping your feet warm. <laughs> Yeah, I have absolutely no clue what it's for either. Uh, but if you need it, Johan next got you covered. If it was the case that creativity was just something you were born with, then the people who had the most creative ideas would also have the most number of creative ideas. And that simply isn't the case. So this is what leads most people to the third myth of creativity. And that is, whether or not you can be born with it or not, by the time you're an adult, you're locked into the amount you have. I'm sure we've all had someone tell us that some people are just more creative than others. I feel that this is one of the most damaging myths of creativity because it locks us into labels and stereotypes. From the time we're young, we're told, oh, he's a job, or she's a bookworm, or even she's the artistic type. So if these people ever have a creative idea, they're forced to disown it simply because they're not the creative type. So we're all born with the same parts. There must then be a way for all of us to be creative to be creative jocks and creative bookworms. It's all about shedding the label of creativity and finding out what it actually is. So, I'll ask you again, what is creativity? In its purest form, creativity is just imagination. And that's my talk. No, 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 I'm just kidding, obviously. <laughs> creativity is the ability to combine old things in new ways. If you take a look at any creative idea throughout history, you'll see that this is the case. Uh, the automobile was a combination of wheels and a motor. The iPhone, everyone's favorite creative idea, is a combination of a cell phone, MP3 player, web browser, and 
about a dozen other devices in a sleep container. Even the granddaddy of all creative ideas, sliced bread, was just the combination of bread and knives <laughs> to solve a problem. And what you have to understand about these ideas is that prior to them coming together, their components were viewed as completely separate. It wasn't until after they were combined that their combination was viewed as the inevitable end. Now what's really cool is this inevitable end, this sense that it's so obvious now, has a scientific name to it. It's called insight, or simply an aha moment. And it can be traced to a specific part of the brain, known as the anterior superior temporal gyrus. Now besides being an awesome name for a scientific punk rock band, the anterior superior temporal gyrus is a small area of the brain in the right temporal lobe, right there, that lights up like crazy anytime we have one of these creative ideas, but at no other time. Researcher Mark Young Beeman, who performed a study in order to identify creativity in the brain, described the function of the anterior superior temporal gyrus as tying together information that people already know, but don't recognize as being related until that key moment. Now, if that isn't the perfect definition of creativity, I don't know what is. But here's where things get really cool, though, because even though our brains are locked inside of our skulls, we can still affect them by what we do in the outside world. In fact, for years, psychologists have prescribed certain depression patients to simply think themselves happy. And incredibly, it works. So shouldn't we also then be able to think ourselves creative? Surprisingly, scientists have worked on this exact problem, and they've come up with a few interesting ways that you can actually make yourself more creative. The first is one I'm sure we can all relate to, relaxation or diversion. How many times have you had your best idea when you've simply walked away from the problem for a bit and gone and done something else? Heck, even Archimedes' favorite uh, famous eureka moment involved him about to get into a bath. Stepping away from the problem for a bit allowed his brain to make connections between dissimilar ideas to come up with one new creative idea. But if you're not a fan of baths, you can always just look up at the sky. Other research has shown that the color blue makes people greatly more creative. Maybe this is why people see so many different shapes in the clouds. Some have said that this is because blue relaxes us. However, I think it may actually be the opposite. Other researchers have independently shown that certain wavelengths of blue light can wake us up. So maybe looking up at the sky and looking at the color blue make us more alert and better able to problem solve, and thus more creative. But if you're one of those guys who doesn't like looking up at the sky and you don't want to take a bath, there's a third creativity hack I know you guys can get behind. Stand-up comedy. <laughs> I'm not talking about doing it, I'm talking about watching stand-up comedy. Research has shown that watching just a few minutes of stand-up comedy greatly increases a person's creative capacity. Can you imagine coming home from school every day and having your mom ask you whether or not you're going to watch your stand-up comedy for the night, <laughs> rather than whether or not you're going to do your homework? That's the kind of world I want to live in. I'm sure you guys would agree as well. But what is it about stand-up comedy that makes it such a powerful catalyst towards creativity? Could it just relax us? Or could it be something deeper? In order to answer this, let's go back to the definition of creativity. Mark Young Beeman, the researcher I mentioned earlier, described insight as the answer coming to you suddenly. You weren't even aware you were thinking it until the moment it pops into your head. Then you just know. Interesting is that all the best stand-up comics inadvertently use this definition of insight when crafting their jokes. They tie together dissimilar information to come up with a surprising and hopefully humorous outcome. In science, it's known as insight, but in comedy, we call it a punchline. How many times have you watched a comedian and thought, that is so true? That is, the, that is the result of the comedian leading through his creative process to come upon his inevitable end. And it's what makes creativity such a great catalyst towards insight. Now I know, some of you are probably thinking, yeah, comedy's a little frivolous, right? There's no way that something as frivolous as comedy can lead towards true insight. I'd like to try and a little experiment right now, actually, with you guys. Uh, who here is familiar with the joke, why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> yeah, it's everybody. We all know the punchline, right? To get to the other side. We've heard it a thousand times. Second question, how many of you actually understand that joke? How many of you get why it's a joke at all? A few hesitant people in the audience right now. 
All right, I'm going to break one of the cardinal rules of comedy right now, and I'm going to explain the joke to you so you can see what insight is all about. I'm going to use uh, some screenshots from an online forum uh, in order to help me do this, showing two people who have just figured the joke out themselves. In the first one, the person says, I've heard this joke at least a million times in my life so far, and I've never actually gotten it. Just two minutes ago, I finally got it. I've heard this joke for the past 13 years. How do I proceed with my life from now on? <laughs> it's a little more dramatic, I think, but it, it inspired somebody else, and he responded. He said, wait, wait, wait. I think I just got it too. They don't mean to the other side of the road. They mean to death, the afterlife. The other side. Um, yeah, that slow sense of it seems so obvious now washing over you is exactly what insight is. And it's exactly what I believe makes comedy such a powerful catalyst towards creativity. I hear some of you still getting the joke as I talk right now. Let it wash over you. I'm sure I'll hear a few towards the end of the speech as well. But this idea of tying together dissimilar ideas is actually what made Johan Nack's lack of experience in the world of office supplies his greatest asset when it came to formulating Whiteout. Since he wasn't bound by what had been done before, he was left with only the inevitable outcome, the end. It was left to him to write the joke around it. But I feel that creativity is one of, the, one of those things best shown rather than told. So I found a few examples of some amazing combinations and creative ideas that I just had to share with you guys. Um, this first one is a vertical garden made out of an over-the-door shoe rack. How great is that? I don't care if you're green or not. That is a great idea. I cannot grow grass, and I think that is a great idea. <laughs> it's taking a product I would never use, and turning into something I might consider buying. Uh, but this next one is absolutely my favorite. This is something that I am definitely going to try soon, and after you see it, you guys are going to try it too. I, I just think it's absolutely brilliant. I don't know how I didn't think of this idea, actually. It is automatic chopsticks. <laughs> Those chopsticks had the spring from a clothespin put between them. The person who created them, exactly, no way. How did you not think of this, right? The person who created them says they're so precise you can pick up a single grain of rice with them. I'm sure we could all use a pair of these, right? <laughs> but just because an idea is creative, I don't want you to think it's always good. Not all creative ideas are good. The uh, next one's an example of that. <laughs> it is a pacifier slash cactus. I don't want to know what problem this is supposed to solve. I just hope this guy doesn't have access to kids or, or get this into any stores. But in each of these cases, the person had to break away from the bounds of what had been done before to think outside the box. In much the same way that Edwin Johannecht was an outsider in the world of office supplies, these people are trying to force themselves to think as outsiders in order to come up with a new creative solution. Which is interesting to think about, because we tend to put a lot of emphasis on expertise in our culture when it comes to fixing problems. But it may be the outsiders who have the true insight, because they're not bound by all the knowledge that an expert has already assumed is fact. They're able to question those assumptions and come up with the right, or at least the most efficient, answer. And there's research to back this up. Researcher Kevin Dunbar, who studies in part how scientists study things, what a job, right? Has found in one of his studies something very interesting. Expertise may actually be counter to creativity. In this study, he examined two separate groups of researchers trying to solve the same problem. In the course of their work, they found a protein that they were trying to examine was being stuck in the filtration system of their, system of their apparatus. Now, they both had to solve this problem. The first group was comprised entirely of E. coli experts. And as you would expect, the experts slowly and methodically worked through the problem, testing every variable, then testing their fixes until they broke, refining their fixes, testing them again until they broke, until they found a fix after a few weeks. The second group was a diverse group and comprised of people from across the scientific fields, including a few med school students. They too had to solve this problem, but they didn't have any shared common scientific lingo between them. They were forced to use analogies and metaphors to reach across the aisle to explain their situations to their fellow outsiders. The same problem that took the experts weeks to solve took the group of diverse scientists just 10 minutes. I want you to let that sink in for a second. It's not that they solved it a few minutes or a few hours faster. They solved it 200 
thousand percent faster than the experts. This is exactly what outsiders have to offer us. They can see problems in new ways to come up with new and amazing fixes. In his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, Thomas Kuhn said, almost always, the men who achieve these fundamental inventions of a new paradigm are either very young or very new to the field whose paradigm they change. So don't let anyone ever tell you that your youth or your inexperience are negatives. They are the greatest asset you have in coming up with new and creative solutions that previous generations have failed to solve. In fact, I saw this in a very real way years ago when I used to perform as an amateur magician. I could perform for children's parties or adults or hobos or anyone who would give me attention, basically. Yeah, I was that guy. <laughs> and I found something very interesting. I could perform the same effect for both adults and children and receive opposing responses. Whereas the adults would be blown away, completely fooled by what I had shown them, the kids, whose minds were still unbound by the limits of reality, were unimpressed. <laughs> <laughs> to them, the impossible was still very much a possibility. It's not that they knew how I did the trick. It's that they didn't know that the trick couldn't be done for real. How amazing is that? What if we could all tap into a little bit of our inner child to embrace the impossible, so we could all act like outsiders and all be more creative for it? All right, so embracing your inner child is well and good, and we've come full circle now, we're fully hippy-dippy, right? What does it all mean? We know what creativity is, we know how to be more creative, but what does it matter? Why am I actually up here talking to you right now? Well, the short answer, is that there are a lot of problems with the world. Problems with hunger, disease, famine. Closer to home, we have issues with inflation, unemployment, debt. And we have a bunch of pundits and politicians trying to solve these problems. The only problem is, they are experts. There's an old saying that goes, when all you have is a hammer, every problem begins to look like a nail. These so-called experts only have purse strings to play with, so they attempt to solve everything by throwing money at it. You all are the outsiders. It is up to you to use your creativity in new ways to find new and inventive solutions that haven't yet been imagined, because there are vastly more creative ideas that haven't been discovered that have, and it's up to you to find them. Because while not all creative ideas are good, <laughs> All creativity is, and it's up to you to use that insight to make the changes that will change the world. Thank you. Woo!